Good day everyone. Today I'm going to talk about diseases of the larynx. So I am Dr. Eric de la Cruz. I am from the West Visayas State University College of Medicine. We'll talk about the larynx. So this is the larynx. The larynx is actually sometimes called the laryngeal complex because it has many parts of cartilages, muscles, and spaces. And the larynx is found in the neck. It is just underneath the skin and muscles right over here sometimes you can see it in in skinny individuals the larynx especially when they swallow you can see it and the larynx is above the trachea and just anterior to the entrance of the esophagus so this is the oral cavity this is the hypopharynx this is the larynx this is the entrance to the esophagus what are the functions of the larynx? First is airway protection. So if you can see in this animation, it protects our airway from the food that we ingest. So it separates food and the air that we breathe. Second is phonation. And these are the vocal folds that are present in the laryngeal complex. This is the vocal folds from the side and this is the vocal folds when viewed from above. When vocal folds vibrate, they produce a sound and the third function of the larynx is control of ventilation you can actually control the air that goes in and out from your uh, lungs so let's go now to the specific functions of the larynx so first is the protection of the respiratory tract so the larynx acts like a sphincter or gate a sphincter or gate and this protects the lungs from the oral, nasal, and pharyngeal secretions. We know that the lungs are sterile and the larynx plays a big role in order to keep the lungs sterile. And this is exactly why there is what we call the cough reflex. Cough is actually not a symptom of a disease but it is actually a defense mechanism. A defense mechanism we're in the the larynx in conjunction with the lungs expel unwanted oral or pharyngeal secretions away from the lungs the second is phonation the laryngeal complex uh, has the exclusive function of production of vocal sound and speech it is done through the vocal cords the vocal cords vibrates and thus there will be production of sound and the last function is control of ventilation wherein the larynx can actually control the air that is going to the lungs and from the lungs going out. Okay, this is manifested by the maneuver called Balsalva maneuver wherein you try to increase intrathoracic pressure and in order to do that, you close your larynx so that it will be built up of intrathoracic pressure. Balsalva maneuver is usually observed in those women trying to give birth or probably a person who wants to force uh, defecation like uh, constipated patients. So when we're talking about the functions of the larynx, of course there will be dysfunction or what we call disorders. So a disorder of the protection of the respiratory tract will lead to aspiration and a disorder of phonation will manifest as hoarseness and a disorder of ventilation is manifested as obstruction. So for this lecture, the flow of discussion will be aspiration, hoarseness, and obstruction. Here we will briefly review the basic anatomy of the laryngeal complex. So the laryngeal anatomy will be discussed according to cartilages, laryngeal cavity, and muscles. First, we're going to talk about cartilages. So this is the laryngeal complex. And first we have the epiglottis. This is the epiglottis. And the thyroid cartilage. Take note that the thyroid cartilage is different from the thyroid gland. The thyroid cartilage is way up and the thyroid gland is way down, way inferior. It is actually found in the trachea. So the thyroid cartilage and the thyroid gland is different. 
So this is the thyroid cartilage. Uh, we also have the cricoid. So the cricoid is the lowermost part of the laryngeal complex. And we have the arytenoids over here. And it looks something like this one in front. These are the arytenoids. Like that. Okay. So this is this is uh, seen from behind. So it looks something like this one. Yeah. So the arytenoids are the one that suspends the vocal folds. We will see that later. And we have minor cartilages such as the corniculate and the cuneiform. It is just seen on top of the arytenoid. Note that in all of the cartilages, only the cricoid cartilage forms a complete ring. So this is the thyroid cartilage. See that it doesn't form a ring, but the cricoid, it forms a complete ring from front to the back. It is a ring. Okay, so this is a 3D render of the laryngeal complex. This is from sketchfab.com. So this is the front view of the laryngeal complex. This is the so this is the thyroid cartilage. Okay, looks something like this one. It is not a complete ring. And below is the cricoid cartilage, and it is a complete ring. Okay. You can actually see the thyroid cartilage when examining a person. So in males, it is usually the Adam's apple. That's the thyroid prominence over here. Then if you palpate the laryngeal complex inferiorly, if you run your fingers inferiorly, you will feel another bump, a prominent bump. This is actually the cricoid. Okay, this is the first bump. Above, we have the hyoid bone, and it is connected to the thyroid cartilage via the thyrohyoid membrane. And below, we have the trachea that is connected to the cricoid. If you have to look at the back of it, then we'll see the epiglottis. And these are the arytenoids. And... On top of it are corniculate and the cuneiform. So this this is the arytenoid. It is the one that is intimately connected with the vocal folds, as we will discuss later. Another vocal folds over here. Okay, so this is the cricoid. See that the cricoid is a complete ring. Now let's talk about laryngeal cavity. So if you have to cut the larynx. We will see soft tissue over here, and of course, this is the passageway of air. The passageway of air are what we call the laryngeal cavity. And the laryngeal cavity can be divided into three areas of the larynx. First is the supraglottis, the glottis, and the subglottis. So this is the glottis. This is the glottic area over here. And above it is, of course, the supraglottis or superior to the glottis. And below the glottis is the subglottis area. Okay, this is the subglottis area, glottic area, and supraglottic area. This is the laryngeal cavity. So the supraglottis is from the epiglottis down to the apex of the ventricle. So this is the apex of the ventricle, the apex of both uh, vocal folds the area over there is the apex okay so all of this is the supraglottis and this area is the glottis it is the area wherein the true vocal folds are found it is from the apex of the laryngeal ventricle to one centimeter below the vocal fold this is around one centimeter and the subglottis is an area that begins one centimeter below the true vocal folds to the inferior edge of the cricoid cartilage. Cricoid cartilage over here. So the laryngeal complex is from the tip of the epiglottis down to the inferior edge of the cricoid cartilage. It doesn't include the trachea or the hyoid. Let's talk about muscles of the larynx. 
So the muscles of the larynx can be extrinsic or intrinsic. So intrinsic muscles pertain to muscles that are found outside the laryngeal complex. So anything that influences the movement of the laryngeal complex but is not part of the laryngeal complex itself. So this includes the strap muscles and the other muscles to the neck. This is the laryngeal complex. So all the muscles that surround it which is not part of it are what we call extrinsic muscles. And the muscles that are within the laryngeal complex are what we call the intrinsic muscles. Let's talk about extrinsic muscles. So this is the laryngeal complex as seen from the side and the muscles that surround it. So extrinsic muscles can be classified either as elevators which influence the movement of the laryngeal complex upward. This include geniohyoid. Geniohyoid is here. So this is connected to the hyoid and the hyoid is connected to the laryngeal complex so when this shortens or contracts it elevates the whole complex up as well as the mylohyoid muscle the stylohyoid muscle the digastrix take note that when the hyoid bone is elevated by any muscle the laryngeal complex is also elevated the last is the tyrohyoid muscle. So this is the thyroid cartilage and this is the hyoid bone. There is a muscle that connects it. It's the tyrohyoid muscle. Tyrohyoid muscle. So when it shortens or contracts, it elevates the laryngeal complex up. And the next type of extrinsic muscles are the depressors. Of course, it's the opposite of the elevators. So the depressors will depress the laryngeal complex inferiorly. So this includes the omohyoid. Omohyoid is this one. It goes to the scapula and the sternohyoid. From the sternum to the hyoid, when it contracts, it depresses the laryngeal complex. Also have the sternothyroid. From the sternum to the thyroid, it also depresses the laryngeal complex. The ones in red, the thyrohyoid, the omohyoid, the sternohyoid, sternothyroid are what we call the strap muscles so the strap muscles are the one that covers the laryngeal complex in the neck and it is the one that are immediately after the skin and the platysma remember that the platysma is a very thin muscle just beneath the skin if you open it up you will find first the strap muscles before seeing the laryngeal complex we'll talk about the intrinsic muscles so to simplify the discussion, we will have to group the intrinsic muscles into four. So the first group is the cricoid group of intrinsic muscles. Second group is the arytenoid group. Third are the vocal fold group. And fourth is the epiglottic group of muscles. To remember, you have to remember cave, C-A-V-E. First, we go now to cricoid group. It only has the cricothyroid muscle. So this is the cricothyroid muscle, this is the thyroid cartilage, and this is the cricoid cartilage. So the muscle that connects them is the cricothyroid muscle. And we have the arytenoid muscles, this one is the arytenoid. And from uh, top view, this is the arytenoid. So again, the arytenoid looks like uh, two thumbs, okay? This is the, the thumbs are the arytenoid, it is found at the back of the vocal fold. And they are the ones essentially opening the vocal fold or closing the vocal fold. The arytenoid muscles. This is the arytenoid muscles from a quarter view. So the arytenoid group is composed of the interarytenoid. So inter, it means it connects one arytenoid to the other. Interarytenoid. The posterior cricoarytenoid. So posterior at the back. And this is the cricoid. This is the arytenoid. So this must be the posterior cricoarytenoid. And we have the lateral cricoarytenoid. So this is the cricoid, the lateral side of the cricoid. So this must be it. Okay, so this is the interarytenoid, the posterior cricoarytenoid, the lateral cricoarytenoid. The next set of intrinsic muscles are the vocal fold muscles. So we have the thyroarytenoid and the vocalis. This is the thyroid cartilage and this is the arytenoid. So the muscles that connect the thyroid and the arytenoid is of course the thyroarytenoid. 
and it has a very similar muscle but it is related to the vocal fold this is the vocal fold the uh, this area so this is what we call the vocalis muscle so this is thyroarytenoid this is the vocalis muscle the next group of muscles are the epiglottic group of muscles so we have the thyroepiglottic muscle so this is a thyroid this is the epiglottis there is a muscle that connects them we'll see that later and we have the ariepiglottic so this is the arytenoid and this is the epiglottis there is a muscle that connects the arytenoid to the epiglottis it is found over here over here so what nerve innervates the intrinsic muscles? So there are only two nerves and it's easy to remember. So all you have to do is to separate the cricothyroid muscle from the rest. And the cricothyroid muscle is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve and the rest from the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So take note that most of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx is innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. This nerve is very, very important because if you have problems in the recurrent laryngeal nerve, almost all of the muscles of your larynx will not be functioning. In contrast to the superior laryngeal nerve, which only innervates the trichothyroid. So let's review the intrinsic muscles. So this is again the larynx. Okay, so first in front, you can see here that we have a muscle that connects the thyroid and the cricoid cartilage we call this the cricothyroid and remember this is the only muscle that is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve and if you go take a look at the back this is the arytenoids over here okay this is the arytenoids like, like that one like that like that one it's the thumb this is the pointer finger so again it is open like that when you move the arytenoids it opens the vocal folds and when you move it closer it, it closes the vocal folds so if you take a look from above this is the glottic cavity and everything else above is the supraglottic cavity if we go downward from the vocal folds below, this is the subglottis. Okay. Now let's go back to the arytenoids. So the muscles that connect the left arytenoid and the right arytenoid is the interarytenoid. We have the oblique part and the transverse part. And this is the posterior cricoid and this is the arytenoid. So this must be the posterior cricoarytenoid. Okay. The the arytenoid spans over here, over there. This one, it's found on the lateral cricoid and connects the arytenoid. So this must be the lateral cricoarytenoid. Okay. All these function to adduct or abduct the arytenoids and doing so will open or close the glottic cavity. Next, we'll go now to vocal fold group of muscles so this is the vocal fold group of muscles we have two actually you can see it here so this is the vocal fold of course the muscle that is adjacent to it is the vocalis and another muscle that is lateral to it is that thyroarytenoid this is arytenoid this is thyroid thyroarytenoid and we have the epiglottic group of muscles. Okay, so we have the arytenoids and the epiglottis. This must be the ariepiglottic muscle. And these ones from the thyroid, this is the thyroid going to the epiglottis. This is the thyroepiglottic muscles. So let's talk about the vocal cords. The vocal cords is found in the glottis or the glottic area. If you can remember the areas earlier, the vocal folds are actually landmarks to know the glottic area. 
and the vocal cords functions like a gate it opens and or abducts and letting the air in and closes and no air can get in the vocal cords are also the generator of sound when you oppose both vocal cords there will be sound that will be generated and phonation process is happening the vocal cords are actually ggg glutis gate and generator of sound so if we have to cut again the larynx and see it from behind so this this part and to this part is the laryngeal complex this is the vocal cord or the vocal fold we have two actually we have the true vocal fold and the false vocal fold the difference of the true vocal fold in the false vocal fold is the muscles you can find muscles in the true vocal fold and this is the glottic area now this is a cut of one side of the glottis so we have two folds we have one fold which is superiorly and doesn't have muscle this is the false vocal fold below it which has muscle of course the vocalis muscle and the tyro arytenoid muscle this is the true vocal fold if you take closely at this section we have the muscle and we have the layers before the muscle the outermost epithelium is a squamous epithelium and it is followed by a uh, lamina propria so we have a superficial intermediate and a deep lamina propria and we have the vocalis muscle this lamina propria is very important in later discussion lamina propria is like a gel and it is stuck to a muscle and if you take a look at uh, histology this is the false vocal fold above you don't have muscle this has muscle so this must be the true vocal fold this is the squamous epithelium and this is the lamina propria okay we have the superficial and the intermediate and deep lamina propria much of the vocal fold movements are due to the movements of the arytenoid group of muscles and also the vocal cord group of muscles and these muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve so this is the laryngeal complex we have actually two relevant nerves we have the superior laryngeal nerve and the recurrent laryngeal nerve okay superior means above and we have here the inferior or the recurrent laryngeal nerve so again the superior laryngeal nerve only innervates the cricothyroid the rest of the muscles are innervated by the recurrent laryngeal nerve. So again, recurrent laryngeal nerve is the nerve of all laryngeal muscles except the cricothyroid muscle. And it also provides sensory innervation to the laryngeal muscle below the glottis. So we have two recurrent laryngeal nerves. We have the left and the right. So if you transect one of the uh, laryngeal nerves, you will have hoarseness. Why? Because the arytenoids won't move. Why? Because the arytenoids will be paralyzed because of the transaction and the vocal folds won't be able to move so take a look at this example uh, notice the movement of the right vocal fold and the left vocal fold okay. good do this e. E. okay in this example try to look at the movement of the arytenoid this is the right arytenoid and the left arytenoid Good. Hold it as long as you can. A nice loud E. Again, notice the movement. Good. Do this. Okay, there is no movement on the right arytenoid, but the left is moving. This is actually a case wherein the arytenoid is paralyzed, probably because of a recurrent laryngeal nerve problem. If you have a bilateral recurrent laryngeal nerve problem, both of this won't be moving at all. Next, we have the superior laryngeal nerve. So this is, again, the laryngeal complex. And this is the superior laryngeal nerve. If you trace it, it goes into the cricothyroid muscle. This is the cricothyroid muscle. So the superior laryngeal nerve also provides sensory innervation to all areas of the larynx above the glottis. Okay, this is the glottis around here. And it provides sensory innervation above. 
this is uh, important later in our discussion as the superior laryngeal nerve provides a sensation over here so that when we eat food it will detect food that is being passed and there will be a reflex that will close the glottis so that it will protect the airway let's go now to aspiration so so aspiration is defined as an abnormal entry of fluids into the lower respiratory tract usually oropharyngeal secretions or sometimes if the person is in supine position gastric contents can reflux back and get into the lower respiratory tract aspiration pneumonia happens when there is aspiration and the lungs get infected as seen in this x-ray so here in the right lung we see there is pneumonia aspiration pneumonia usually has a 21% mortality that's why we should take aspiration very seriously because it can really affect our patients aspiration happens when there is failure of defense mechanism in the larynx there are two important defense mechanism in the larynx first is the glottic closure reflex and the cough reflex the glottic closure reflex also known as the laryngeal adduction reflex meaning it adducts okay it adducts it closes the glottis and it is initiated when pharynx is touched by food and water so as you can see in this animation when food touches the pharynx the glottic closure reflex is initiated so the glottic closure reflex the glottis closes the vocal fold closes when there is uh, food that is touching the pharynx it is to protect our uh, lungs from aspiration the glottic closure reflex is more active when you're awake and less active if you're asleep or unconscious so this is very important if you have patients who are unconscious because they tend to have more cases of aspiration they tend to be more at risk for aspiration because the glottic closure reflex is less active it's also very important in uh, anesthesia whenever you will have surgery and you let the patient sleep this is the time that the patient can aspirate the next reflex is the cough reflex so the cough reflex is initiated when you build up air in a closed glottis you close your glottis and you have a build up just below it it is followed by a rapid air expulsion to open the glottis so if you cannot close a glottis you cannot cough and if you don't have cough reflex you won't be able to clear secretions or aspirated materials in your trachea and you have a higher risk of aspiration pneumonia so this video explains the cough reflex typical cough involves a deep inspiration tight closure of the glottis quick and forceful contraction of the expiratory muscles and then sudden opening of the glottis while the contraction of the expiratory muscles continues. High intrapulmonary pressure is generated. Once the glottis is opened, a blast of air expels foreign particles or secretions. Cough can be impaired when the glottis fails to close tightly or when respiratory muscles are weak or paralyzed, limiting inspiration and strong expiration. We'll see here that cough is a defense mechanism and it serves to clear out secretions from the lungs and from the trachea. So personally, I don't really give anti-cough medicines because uh, in doing so, I deprive them of, of the cough reflex. Okay, so it depends on the circumstance actually. Now let's talk about hoarseness. Hoarseness is an exclusive vocal folds problem. So whenever you have a hoarse patient, always think of the vocal folds the opposite of hoarseness is a good voice so you must have conditions for a good voice otherwise you will have hoarseness so these are the conditions of having a good voice number one is a good vocal fold approximation number two is favorable vibratory properties third is a favorable vocal fold shape and the last is control of length and tension if all of these are present in your vocal folds you will have a good voice and if one or more of this is not present then 
probably you will have hoarseness. Let's discuss the conditions for a good voice. First is a good vocal fold approximation. Now let's take this as an example. This is the larynx and these the white ones are the vocal folds. Note that the vocal folds meet and they approximate to each other. And that is one condition for a good voice. So just listen to this. Notice that the vocal folds approximate in the midline. Now let's go back to this example. Example wherein there is a vocal fold paralysis. Okay. Good, do this. E. E. Again. E. E. Okay, so there's a big gap and the vocal folds weren't able to approximate in the midline. So this is a right vocal fold paralysis. And the next example is a singer's nodule. You see this, this patient has a nodule on the right vocal fold. The nodule impedes the approximation of the vocal folds and thus this is a poor vocal fold approximation and it will result to hoarseness. Again. So a singer's nodule is also called a vocal fold nodule and usually it is uh, the most common problems in singers and also in teachers and other professional voice users. So this is brought about by chronic abuse and misuse of their voice because these usually are the ones that use their voice for a long time and they develop nodules. That's why it is very important to teach these professional voice users good techniques in speaking so that they won't have hoarseness in their careers. So the next condition for a good voice is a favorable vibratory property of the vocal folds. So the vocal fold vibration occurs by the lamina propria mucosa as seen earlier. And this lamina propria and mucosa will produce the mucosal wave. So you need a mucosal wave so that you will have a good voice. So this is again a cross-section of the vocal fold. As seen here is the muscle and we have the squamous epithelium. In between the epithelium and the muscle, we have the lamina propria. The lamina propria has three layers. The first is the superficial, the intermediate, and the deep lamina propria. This lamina propria and the epithelium will produce the mucosal wave. This is a diagram to show the mucosal wave, waves from below and above. And this is the muscle. And you will notice it, there's also a wave here. So these waves are important so that you will have a good voice. Now let's go now to examples of a bad voice from a not so good vibratory property. So this is a mucus retention cyst. It is present on the lamina propria of the vocal fold. As expected, this will have a poor vibratory property. So let's listen to the voice of a um, mucus retention cyst. Three. Right there it is. It's a mucus retention cyst, not an epidermoid, but a mucus And another example is glottic cancer or cancer of the vocal folds. You see, of course, this is already occupying the whole vocal fold and we will expect that there's no wave at all. <laughs> Mm. 
Mm. Okay. So this is the most common cancer in the aerodigestive tract and usually caused by smoking. So this is being treated by laser if it's in the early stage. So we will notice that there will be scarring after the surgery. Okay, good. Now clear. Even after surgery, especially of glottic cancer, you will still have hoarseness. It's because there is no mucosal wave found. So this is another uh, example of a glottic cancer, but this is way, way much earlier. You see, you have superficial whitish lesions on both vocal fold. Of course, you will expect that the mucosal wave is not present. Try it again. Mm. Not the high one. The next condition for a good voice is a favorable shape of the vocal fold. So normally, our vocal fold has a shape like this one. Okay, very smooth and very straight. So you will expect a good voice if you have this shape. In this next example, you see that the vocal fold is not really straight it is bowing or curving so listen to the voice okay you see because of that not so good shape it doesn't approximate in the midline so So this is what we call vocal folds atrophy. It is usually seen in vocal fold paralysis or in elderly. And in this example, if you take a look at the vocal fold, it is really bloated. This is polypoid. It looks like polyps. And this is what we call Reinke's edema. Okay, take a look at the vocal folds. Okay, it is very bloated. It is polypoid. It looks like grapes. And it is very abnormal in shape. And let's listen to the voice. <laughs> so Rankis edema is usually caused by chronic smoking. This is expected in uh, patients who smokes really 30 years or prolonged chronic smoking. The last condition for a good voice is a good control of length and tension. The length and tension of the vocal fold determine its pitch. These are the muscles of the vocal fold, the vocalis and the thyroarytenoid muscle, the contraction of which will determine its pitch. So, so the longer it is, it has more tension and therefore the pitch is higher and the shorter it is, which is more relaxed, has a low pitch. It is like a garter. So the longer it is, the more tense. So there must be higher pitch and shorter which has lower tension it has a low pitch it's like the guitar if you try to tune it and make it make the strings more tense then it will have a higher pitch uh, compared to shortening it or lessening the tension it will have a lower pitch so the length of the vocal fold is determined primarily by the action of the cricothyroid muscle so when the cricothyroid muscle is moving it moves the thyroid cartilage forward and moving the thyroid cartilage forward, it lengthens the vocal fold. This one, this, if this moves forward, the length of the vocal fold muscles will be longer and thus you will have a higher pitch. Okay? So cricothyroid increase the length and tension of the vocal fold and you will have a high pitch voice. The thyroarytenoid on the other hand, this is the thyroarytenoid. If it contracts, it shortens and a shorter Vocal fold has a low pitch. It decreases the length and tension. Let's take this for example. You take note of the length of the vocal fold and listen to the pitch. Again, this is the function of the 
cricothyroid muscle to lengthen to move it forward and lengthen the vocal folds and the action of the thyroid to shorten it okay so another video very useful video from the national center for voice and speech try to listen good yeah okay so i'm holding the arytenoids in place from the back and here i have the thyroid and here's the the cricothyroid muscle and the cricoids down here and so if i hold this in place and just push this you can see it's simulating how it look, and look how far back movement. it'll go too look at the rocking motion and it moves Whoa. laterally too and so you can see how the the CT muscle. This is a cow will, larynx, just this for is the, the record. Cow, and you can see how the CT muscle will pull and stretch on the thyroid. And then by so doing from that, the inside. it will lengthen and stretch the vocal folds on the inside. Rock it again. So if I go back, they get shorter and, and kind of like fatter. And then if I go forward, they get more tense. Can you see? Mm -hmm. So like that, and then like that. And that is how you change pitch. Okay, so there's a very, very good video to show the action of the cricothyroid muscles. Okay, again, this is the cricothyroid muscle and it is innervated by the superior laryngeal nerve. This, in turn, will control the high pitch. So the superior laryngeal nerve will control the high pitch. And if you cut it, inadvertently especially on thyroid surgeries you will have inability to reach high pitch sound and sometimes this nerve is what we call the galli cursi nerve named after the opera singer galli cursi the story of galli cursi is that she was a celebrated soprano singer and after she underwent thyroid surgery she wasn't able to reach the high notes already because during the surgery, the superior laryngeal nerve was cut and post-op, she wasn't able to reach the high notes and therefore it ended her career. Now let's go to obstruction. So the larynx is actually the narrowest part of the airway. So the airway starts from the nose to the nasal cavity, oral cavity, hypopharynx, and the larynx below the larynx it's already the lower airway and this is the upper airway so the larynx is the narrowest part of the upper airway and we have two configurations we have the adult configuration and the pediatric configuration in adults the narrowest part of the upper airway is the glottis around here and in pediatric patients the narrowest part is the subglottis or near the cricoid area so so in adults the larynx is shaped like a rhomboid and the narrowest part is in the glottic area and the pediatric group it is shaped like a cone and the narrowest part is in the cricoid area so if you take a look at it above this is the adult this is the glottis or the vocal fold this is narrower compared to the cricoid seen in black so the opening of the glottis is much narrower than the opening of the cricoid on pediatric patients this is the opening of the glottis and this is the opening of the cricoid seen in black and the area of the cricoid is the subglottis you see that the subglottic area is still much much narrower than the glottic area so the larynx being the narrowest part of the upper airway even narrows on edema and inflammation so when there is inflammation it narrows even more and we can see it in this diagram there will be increase in resistance due to edema by increasing the wall thickness by only 1 mm and this is more pronounced in pediatric patients because of their small caliber only a 1 mm increase in wall thickness will reduce the lumen by 50 percent Compared to an adult, a 1 mm increase in wall thickness will only produce a 25% reduction in lumen. And this will have a higher resistance compared to this one. This is due to the equation of a Poisset's law. 
wherein the resistance will increase whenever there's a decrease in radius. And we can see this in the following example. So this is the larynx. And here you can see 25% obstruction. You will have symptoms. 50%, this is already the lumen. You will have symptoms. 75, this is only the lumen. And 90%, this is uh, life-threatening already. So the symptoms of narrowing can be respiratory distress or stridor. Respiratory distress is noted on a patient when the patient already have tachypnea and the patient is very anxious, flared nostrils, sternal retractions, intercostal retractions already. And you can see this both in infants and adults. And there is already stridor in upper airway lumen obstruction. So strider is defined as a high-pitched sound produced by a turbulent airflow through a partially obstructed airway. So this is the airway. This is the laryngeal complex. This is the trachea. And below, this is the lower airway. We can hear an inspiratory strider whenever we have an obstruction in the supraglottis. We have a biphasic stridor if you have an obstruction in the glottis or subglottis. And we have an expiratory stridor if it's below the glottis or it's in the trachea. And we have wheeze if it's coming from the lungs. Listen to the following sounds. So this is an inspiratory stridor and it is usually found in the supraglottic area. <laughs> So whenever you can hear this sound, you will suspect that the obstruction is in the supraglottic area. Next is the biphasic stridor. Usually biphasic is in the glottic and subglottic area. So biphasic strider again in the glottis and subglottis area. If you can hear this biphasic strider, you'll know that it is in the glottic and subglottic area. And remember that the narrowest part of the adult and in the pediatric population is the glottis and subglottis respectively. So if you can hear a biphasic strider, it is very, very narrowed already. So this is an emergency if you hear a biphasic strider. Contrast the two to wheezing. Wheezing is more of a polyphonic sound, which means you can hear many tones. And it, it is usually expiratory. Okay. Compare that to, compare that to biphasic strider. It's high pitch. So causes of airway obstruction can be congenital, infectious, a tumor, or from trauma. So let's discuss first a congenital cause, laryngomalacia. So Mila, a three months old female, presents with stridor and noisy breathing, which worsens on feeding, crying, supine position, and agitation. Laryngomalacia is defined as a congenital soft and floppy larynx that collapses on inspiration and this is caused by the failure of the supraglottis to develop so this is the supraglottis this is the epiglottis and it is very narrowed it is also described as an omega shape like the omega sign and this is an example of a laryngomalacia patient this three months year old infant was brought to the outpatient department with complaints of noisy breathing since two months this clipping shows the external appearance of the baby while it is breathing. It is already in distress of, because of sub substernal retractions. So laryngomalacia can only be diagnosed by taking a look at the, the supraglottis by either a telescope or a flexible laryngoscope. 
This clipping shows video laryngoscopic examination of the child. What could be the diagnosis? Okay. Okay, you see that the it is omega shape and it collapses on inspiration. It collapses and closes the lumen of the larynx. Very, very soft larynx. And this is a typical finding of a laryngomalacia. And it is usually congenital and uh, observed after, the, after birth. Okay, it closes on inspiration. The sucking of air will collapse the larynx and patient will present with stridor. So this is an example from Dr. Jin Liu from Singapore. So this is a picture of a laryngomalacia and this is the normal pediatric larynx. So the normal pediatric larynx, it is more open. Look, it's more open. This is the lotus. Look in laryngomalacia, it is collapsed. Okay. This is a floppy voice box, very narrow and you can't see the vocal cords. Here is another example. Look at how everything flops in and note the strider. Here is yet another example. This one completely collapses and pinches on itself. Laryngomalacia is the most common cause of strider among infants and the usual management is just observation and we'll just wait for the supraglottis to develop to mature for around uh, 12 to 18 months and no surgery is needed unless the patient is very symptomatic and therefore some kind of surgery will be needed to re-establish the airway. So the next cause of stridor are infectious and here we will discuss epiglottitis or the infection of the epiglottis which is a supraglottic structure so Jose a 68 year old male had fever stridor and difficulty swallowing and this is very characteristic of an epiglottitis fever stridor which which means a laryngeal problem and difficult swallowing which is uh, an area near the entrance of the esophagus. Epiglottitis is also known as supraglottitis and on PE you can hear an inspiratory stridor, a thumb sign on neck x-ray lateral and it is caused usually by H influenzae. So this is Mr. Jose's x-ray and you see here that this is the airway and this is the epiglottis and this is the larynx. And you see the epiglottis is very swollen. See right there. This is what we call the thumb sign. Is this a thumb? Compared to the normal epiglottis, which is not a thumb. So in epiglottitis, especially in, in children, you'll notice that they will assume a tripod position. I like this one. The tripod. Okay, with their with their mouth opened with the neck extended and sometimes their tongue out in order to breathe this position affords that the tongue is moved forward and the uh, epiglottis that accompanies the tongue is also moved forward assuring them of an airway rather than they will sit or they will be in a supine position so tripod position will offer them some airway so if you can see this in children suspect epiglottitis. The next infectious cause of strider is what we call the croup. Charisse, a three-year-old female, had low-grade fever and a seal-like bark, seal, like the animal seal, and biphasic strider. From this information alone, you'll know that it is caused by infection and this is usually in the glottic or subglottic area. So this is Charisse. This young lady actually has a fairly impressive uh, croupy cough and this kind of this uh, seal like um, barky cough and, and some strider. So, strider and uh, barking cough is very descriptive of 
croup. So croup is also known as laryngotracheitis. It is seen as a steeple sign on x-ray. So this is the steeple sign. So this is actually the laryngeal complex and the trachea. So if you have an infection and inflammation between the subglottis and the trachea, we call it a laryngotracheitis or croup, you will have this configuration of the airway like a stipple. It only means that there is inflammation above here. It should be a little more straight. And this is croup. So croup is usually caused by the parainfluenza virus and croup can lead to an airway emergency. Next cause of stridor is a, from a tumor. We'll discuss here laryngeal cancer. So 71 year old male presents with respiratory distress, stridor and hoarseness. So as discussed earlier, if you have hoarseness, it is an exclusive problem of the vocal fold. Laryngeal cancer usually is from the glottis. We call it the glottic cancer. And it's the most common cancer in the aerodigestive tract. So this is a case of a laryngeal glottic cancer. There you go, good. So hoarseness of voice plus a very small lumen already. This is very descriptive of a glottic cancer. And since the vocal folds is covered by the squamous epithelium as seen in the vocal fold section, the most common type of glottic cancer is a squamous cell carcinoma because squamous cell carcinoma comes from a squamous epithelium. And this is how we examine the vocal folds in the clinic. This is by doing the indirect mirror laryngoscopy. We, we pass a dental mirror into the back of the throat and try to take a look at the vocal folds by the reflection of it from above. Take a look at this. Okay. That's the epiglottis. And that's the vocal folds, the white ones. Okay, see the vocal folds opening and closing. To do this, we have to hold out the tongue. Okay, that's it. Okay, so in this example, you can see any masses like uh, laryngeal masses by just doing an indirect mirror laryngoscopy. So this is the cut larynx from a uh, patient with glottic carcinoma we, we remove all the laryngeal complex and you see here that the left vocal fold has a tumor on it this is a operation called the total laryngectomy and it is curative of laryngeal cancer so the next cause of obstruction is from trauma or foreign body so we have here one year old male Presented with cyanosis and stridor after eating chicken bone. And this is what we call the foreign body aspiration. Take a look at this example. What did you notice? You notice an expiratory stridor. And this is the x-ray of the patient. So this is the neck x-ray. The black one is air. Okay, it should be air all throughout. But you see here that there is a foreign body. This is the chicken bone. And on CT scan, it is further seen here. This is the chicken bone. Notice that in this area, we don't have any bone except for the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is here. We don't have any bone because this is cartilage. So this bone must be the foreign body so what do we do here we send the patient in the operating room and get the foreign body by doing a direct laryngoscopy again this is the configuration of the pediatric larynx it is conical in shape 
so if you have a foreign body like this one it will lodge in the subglottis area and the patient will have expiratory stridor okay remember the cricoid is the narrowest so in summary the larynx is a structure in our airway made up of muscles and cartilages that functions to protect our airway produce our voice and control air entry this function of the larynx will manifest as aspiration hoarseness and airway obstruction understanding the structure and function of the larynx will help us understand the different laryngeal disorders so my lecture is already finished if you have any questions feel free to email me at this email address or visit my website or my fb page thank you